Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jeff Macker. I'm a professor of uh, strategy, economics, and policy at the McCann School of Business. And I'm also the academic director for the Center for Business and Public Policy, which is the institute that's hosting a uh, free lunch for some of you. Because <laughs> some of you didn't get a lunch. First mover advantage. Uh, the center was founded in 2012. Uh, we examine issues at the nexus of business and public policy. So think about a regulatory or policy issue that affects firms, and then how firms affect to shape regulation and public policy. Very much economics focused. Very much using objective, credible data and information. We promote education over advocacy. Uh, we're nonpartisan. Uh, we uh, attempt to touch three different stakeholders. Industry practitioners, policymakers, and academics, and I think the table theory reflects that. Our output is white papers, research papers, leave behind, as well as conferences, colloquia, uh, and meetings. Uh, this meeting in particular is called the Georgetown on the Hill series. In particular, we come down to the hill because nobody can get to Georgetown easily. Uh, this is the second in a three part series on new debates, intentions, and antitrust. Our first is in November, November 27th, on uh, what is the future hold. This one is how to handle big tech. Mark Whitener is one of our senior administrative innovations fellows, so he's moderating the session. Mark's got 35 years of experience uh, dealing with uh, mergers and reviews and investigations and litigation for TV, told the stories he could tell. Uh, he's the antitrust, he was the antitrust board at the council for the competition law and policy uh, part of TV. He was also deputy director of the FTC's Bureau of Competition and where he worked for both political parties. He's got an undergraduate degree from Washington University of St. Louis in political science, and then he did his law degree at the University of Chicago. Great, thank you, Jeff. Hey, and uh, thank you all for coming. Welcome. There we go. Um, okay, let me start by introducing our, our panel, um, and I'll just sort of go from this end to that end, and then we'll get, we'll get going with the program. Um, as we go, I think we'd all welcome your questions um, as, as we are going through our bit, and then we'll try to save some time at the end for kind of an open floor for Q&A. Uh, okay, to my left, John Mayo, Professor of Economics, Business, and Public Policy at Georgetown. Uh, he serves as the Executive Director for the Georgetown Center on Business and Public Policy, which he founded in 2002. Um, he's published dozens of articles in economics, law, and public policy journals. Um, he's held a number of senior positions at Georgetown, including serving as Dean of the McDonough School of Business. Uh, John has also been Chief Economist of the U.S. Senate Small Business Committee and has served as an advisor and consultant to both public and private agencies. To John's left is Terrell McSweeney, a partner at Covington and Burling. Terrell is a former commissioner of the FTC, and prior to joining the FTC, she served as Chief Counsel for Competition Policy and Intergovernmental Relations for the U.S. Department of Justice and a Trust Division. Uh, Terrell's government service also includes work as counsel on the Senate Judiciary Committee. Delighted to have Terrell here. To Terrell's left, Howard Shalansky, uh, professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center. Uh, he received his JD and PhD in economics from the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, he clerked for Justice Scalia on the Supreme Court. Under President Obama, Howard was director of the Bureau of Economics at the Federal Trade Commission and then served as administrator of the White House Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. Um, in addition to being a member of the Georgetown faculty, Howard practices antitrust law at Davis Polk and Warwick. And then finally, to Howard's left is Paul Eady. Paul is a partner at Freshfields Brookhouse Derringer. He previously held positions in government antitrust enforcement, serving as counsel to two FTC commissioners, and as a litigation attorney in the FTC's Bureau of Competition. Paul is trained in both law and economics, having received undergraduate and graduate degrees in economics with a special specialization in industrial organization. Paul's practice primarily involves representing parties before the DOJ, FTC, and state attorneys general. Okay, let me just do a little bit of an introduction and set the stage for our, for our panel discussion. Antitrust is hot. This would come as a surprise to the thousands of law students who avoided signing up for the class every year because it's seen as arcane, lacking in clear rules, and hard to get a good grade unless you happen to major in economics in college. 
Articles about antitrust are now appearing regularly in the media. This morning's Wall Street Journal did not disappoint. Page A1, top of the page. Uh, another article about Google and antitrust. Um, antitrust is featured in the policy platforms of many presidential candidates. Enforcement task forces are being formed, waves of investigations launched, legislative uh, initiatives being proposed, hearings being held. And some basic questions are being asked. Has antitrust enforcement been too lax? Is the cure for a variety of concerns about business conduct, especially in the tech sector, more antitrust enforcement, where a handful of large firms seem to dominate markets, dominate policy discussions, and dominate commercial and social interactions? If these are concerns, then is the answer more aggressive antitrust enforcement? What are the risks of giving antitrust a more prominent role in these industries? Will it be misused for partisan political ends, used to regulate conduct that ought to be governed by other laws, or abused by competitors to gain an advantage that they couldn't achieve in the marketplace? Thinking about these questions requires us to consider some even more basic questions. What is antitrust? What kinds of behavior does it cover? What does it leave alone and why? What should antitrust address going forward? Do existing policies of interpretation and enforcement in the United States, developed over about a, a half century and founded on principles of economics, need to be retained, tweaked, or fundamentally rethought? And what's going on in the rest of the world, and how does it affect what we do here? I'd like to say that we'll answer all those questions in the next hour and a half. <laughs> Thousands of law students certainly wish that were possible, but it's not, so we'll do the best we can. And so I'm going to begin with a question for all of our panelists. A good starting point for what direction U.S. antitrust policy should take in the future is what does antitrust mean today? Is there at least a rough consensus among U.S. courts, agencies, and analysts about the goals and core principles of antitrust? And if, if so, how would you summarize this? Open to the floor. I'll start. Um, so the antitrust laws regulate competitive conduct, largely of companies, but, but also of individuals, L regulate the competitive conduct of, of these companies in um, two basic ways, pursuant to, largely pursuant to the Sherman Act. And I'm going to back to some real basics before I talk about the, uh, the consensus and whether there is a consensus. But regulated pursuant to the Sherman Act, which prevents um, two basic types of conduct coordinated conduct between companies that harms competition, net of efficiencies, although I'm already building in the consensus there. And also unilateral conduct, which un under Section 2 of the Sherman Act, which uh, prohibits monopolization, attempted monopolization, unilateral conduct by, by companies that, that harms uh, the competitive process and harms competition. And again, I'm already importing uh, some of the consensus. The, there's um, a number of other statutes that have been developed over the years that, that are uh, largely in aid of or, or uh, contribute to those two basic principles of, of preventing anti-competitive coordinated conduct and anti-competitive unilateral conduct, dominant firm conduct. Uh, but those are, those are the basic statutes that, that govern and inform uh, almost all the other statutes, and we'll, we'll, I'm sure we're going to be talking about all of them. Uh, there's a, again, it's a common law, and there's a huge body of jur jurisprudence that's been developed over decades, uh, since 1890, if not before, uh, on what constitutes a violation of the Sherman Act, what violates a con uh, of what constitutes a violation of some of the other statutes that, that uh, are designed to implement the Sherman Act principles. Uh, but that jurisprudence over time became uh, largely um, incoherent as a single body of law, um, unless you're uh, purely a student of, of, uh, of common law methodology. So over the last 40 years, and this is, this is an incredibly simple uh, summation of, of the development of antitrust laws over, over 120 years, but over the last 40 years or so, a consensus developed uh, within the antitrust bar and among the courts, largely um, uh, pushed by the Supreme Court of the United States uh, and, uh, and by economists around uh, a consumer welfare standard for the, uh, for, as the, the guiding principle in antitrust. Uh, 
Um, the, the consumer welfare standard as applied in the, in the consensus as, as, as it's uh, applied today um, uh, focuses on the creation or enhancement of market power, and we'll talk about what that is, uh, by reducing uh, competition by harming the competitive process, by harming competition as opposed to, as distinguished from, harming uh, merely competitors, and we'll always add that word, merely competitors, uh, without any offsetting efficiencies or consumer benefits, uh, and thereby, as a result of the conduct, the lack of efficiency associated with that, uh, that conduct harms consumers, that is, reduces consumer welfare. The relevant conduct is, uh, includes mergers, uh, cartel agreements, price fixing, uh, conduct by single uh, dominant firms, which is, I think is largely what we'll be talking about today, what single dominant firms, the so-called digital platforms, can do uh, individually or through, uh, through transactions to harm competition in a way that harms consumers on net. Uh, the consensus also includes what, what uh, antitrust is not designed to prevent, some of which I've already said, and then Howard and, and Terrell should add to this. Um, it is not designed to prohibit uh, companies from growing, from obtaining market power other than through exclusionary or predatory conduct. But we want firms to compete vigorously, to get bigger, to be motivated to actually exploit or to realize the gains of, of the, uh, the efforts that they make to become bigger, to become successful. Um, and it, uh, the, the antitrust laws also do not prohibit firms, once they've become successful, from essentially realizing the benefits of, of having become successful. That is, for example, pricing at a level that is uh, uh, considered to be monopolistic as long as the, the, the conduct that they're engaging in is not exclusionary or predatory as the law defines it. Uh, but also, as I've also at least implied, um, uh, the antitrust laws are not designed to protect competitors, at least under our current consensus. And I'll pause there. I'm happy to jump in, or Howard, if you want to go next, all right. Go right up. Um, I, I think that was an excellent summary of the consensus that currently exists, um, especially at the court level. I would say that um, over, if you look at American antitrust law over the course of the more than 100 and I'm not, I actually didn't take economics as an undergrad, and I'm not very good at math, and I'm perfectly good antitrust lawyer, so I'm not sure who said that. <laughs> uh, but over the last 130 years since the Sherman Act, right? But then uh, 100 and, you know, whatever, 1914, uh, 107 years, more or less, six, whatever it is, um, since the Clayton Act and the FTC Act. Um, there have been periods of consensus and periods of change in our antitrust laws. So I think if you look at the whole arc here, you see that we we did have we do have a, a current consensus. We are actually in a very active debate. Many of you here in the room are involved on the front lines of that right now, in which there is almost no consensus among policymakers that uh, about what U.S. antitrust law should be, as far as I can tell, and a lot of discussion up here on the Hill about whether reforms are needed. So while the courts, I think, do have a relative consensus and enforcement agencies quite rightly are enforcing the law as they understand it to be, there's a very active discussion. And a lot of it stems around this issue of a consumer welfare standard whether there ought to be a broader public interest standard, whether it is correct to think that the purpose of antitrust law is to protect the competitive process, to be sort of the referee in the marketplace as opposed to protecting individual competitors, uh, extending beyond protecting the competitive process to other values that may be very important social values but won't, won't be directly connected to competition or outcomes from competition, um, and whether it is right to have a law about protecting against monopolies that in fact allows monopolies to flourish as long as they legally acquire their status that way. I've always found that to be an interesting conundrum. Um, so I think there's a very big debate happening. Um, I, I'm, I'm intentionally not giving you my personal view about what the right <laughs> um, outcome for that debate is, because I think we have to be honest that um, that we are at a moment uh, and an inflection point in the discussion around competition that is really important. 
I want to add to the Sherman Act discussion just to underscore that there are other competition statutes that, in my view, are equally important. The Clayton Act, which was passed in 1914 alongside the FTC Act. Now, of course, I'm a former FTC commissioner, so I care a lot about the FTC Act. Um, what's important about these two statutes is they follow on the Sherman Act. And what we did in the Sherman Act in the US is say, OK, we should stop things that are anti-competitive and, and harm the markets, and, and we should stop people, uh, companies with monopoly power from extending that monopoly power in an anti-competitive way. But we didn't really have a framework in place that um, protected competition um, in, in a forward-looking way. We didn't have an approach that was incipient. And so the Clayton Act, which allows the agencies to review mergers, challenge them if they're anti-competitive, Competitive, is about uh, is a forward-looking statute, inherently predictive, and it's about protecting competition by preventing anti-competitors. And the FTC Act and the FTC, which is created at the same time, 1914, um, as, as those two laws are being passed, also has this additional unfairness authority associated with it that is about protecting against unfair competition. Now, what that means <laughs> is a source of a big debate as well. It's generally regarded as tracking very closely the Sherman Act, but there are instances where it actually is applied as a standalone basis, uh, in a standalone basis as well, um, such as invitations to collude, where the agency has found that um, they are, the conduct doesn't violate the Sherman Act because no agreement is reached, but is inherently harm competitive practice or competition in a marketplace, especially if it comes to fruition. And so in that way, I think um, there it's important to look at the, the suite of laws here um, and think about the whole context and understand that in the US, even though we are the, I think, oldest major economy with an antitrust have also been in the process of constantly adapting that to the marketplace as it has evolved over time. I'll stop there. I'll just add a gloss that might help us transition also to the to the big tech uh, questions. I think that there has been that there remains a very strong consensus about the goals of antitrust. The goals of antitrust are to make sure that there is competition and low pricing for consumers. Uh, but also to make sure uh, that there are not uh, large profit margins and large concentrations of power occurring in different markets. So if, if there's a consensus, I think that the consensus is antitrust should work to prevent concentrated markets and it should work to prevent uh, increasingly large profit margins going to producers as opposed to having surplus being driven to consumers through competition. There is a big question about how well antitrust has achieved those goals, and I think that's what's driving a lot of the debate. If you look at the underlying studies that have really motivated a lot of the, the debate, they are studies that have shown growing market concentration across many industrial sectors in the United States, that is to say fewer players selling to a larger share of the market. When my grandfather had his little grocery store outside of Philadelphia, he was one of several hundred grocery outlets in the metropolitan Philadelphia area. Today in the United States, probably two-thirds of all groceries are sold by just two companies under different brand names. Those would be Kroger's and Walmart. So if you take that to different segments, people look out at the world and they say, rising concentration. We all agree antitrust should prevent that. The other thing that we've seen is um, rising profit margins across many industrial sectors. Now, uh, competition and high profit margins are antithetical. Um, if there's a lot of competition, that dry, it should, in theory, drive uh, prices closer to costs. Now, in groceries, actually, prices margins are very, very low, razor thin, and that creates other problems that are beyond what we can get into today. But in lots of, lots of other sectors, there are very high profit margins. So people look there and they say, well, look, rising concentration, rising profit margins, is antitrust really doing its job? And that has led to a debate that spills over into some of the things we're going to get to today. Has the focus on prices which is a focus that really came into being in the 60s and 70s and evolved through the common law process that Paul uh, alluded to through the courts. The, as the focus on low prices blinded us to the fact that you can have low prices 
and still have large concentrations of market power and, in some cases, high profit margins, should we be focusing more actually on the structure of the economy without direct regard to prices? And that's what antitrust law used to do. Back in the early 1960s, mergers under the Clayton Act of grocery stores were prevented in the Los Angeles area that would have created one chain, bonds, with a market share of about 7 or 8%. 7 or 8%. Why was that merger blocked? That was merger was blocked because the court said, we have data showing that the number of independent grocery stores in Los Angeles has shrunk from over 4,000 down to 3,300. This is a tendency towards monopoly. We need to pr protect the structure of the market, an atomized market in which a small business person can get into the market. It was a structural focus. There were lots of other cases that had this structural focus. What was left on the ground there, and this also gets to something else Paul was talking about, is efficiency. The court said outright in the Vons grocery case, we don't question that Vons will be able to deliver groceries more cheaply to consumers and will drive down grocery prices. We nonetheless are concerned about this tendency towards concentration. We leave the efficiency aside and we focus on the concentration. That has completely shifted over the last 50 years to the point that if you're producing lots of output at, high, at low prices and you continue to maintain your market lead and have a massive market share at low prices, we don't worry about the size of your firm, we don't worry about your market share as long as prices are low. Has that blinded us to some other values that are being lost? And that's part of the debate that, we, that comes in. The final point I want to make is antitrust law is absolutely agnostic as to the product that is being sold. We go up and bust, up, bust apart cartels in cigarettes because we want to get you more cigarettes cheaper. We bust apart uh, collusive agreements in liquor because we want to get you more liquor cheaper. So. It's up to you folks here, it's up to Congress to decide what can and can't be sold, or what can and can't be sold in an unregulated market. Antitrust is agnostic because we don't want one assistant attorney general deciding what's good and bad for people. People should decide that. We don't want five with all respect. If they're all like Terrell, I'd go for it, but they're not all like Terrell. We don't want five FTC commissioners deciding what's good and bad for us. So that gets made at a, at a congressional level or left to the open market, but we don't question in antitrust whether something is good for bad for people. You raising the price of candy and depriving children of rotten teeth, that's terrible. More candy at lower prices. So that has been the value that antitrust has, has, has pursued, and the question is, as we get to the big tech platforms, which bring all of us lots of stuff cheap or free, do we need to rethink some of the other market effects that are emerging? And that has driven a lot of, I think, the big tech debate that we're all thinking about today. Let me weigh in. I think Paul and Howard and Terrell have done a magnificent job of giving an overview of antitrust. Uh, I'll try to be brief and, and summarize from my own perspective. Uh, of course, since 1890, the Sherman Act, uh, we know that antitrust laws and enforcement have been the primary uh, body that promotes and preserves and protects and enhances competition in this country. Uh, what I would say, jumping over some of the things that you guys mentioned, is in the last 30 years, I think antitrust has been subject to, let's call it both centripetal forces and centrifugal forces, forces that have congealed our understanding in law and economics about the things that are the proper domain of antitrust. I think it was referred to as the consumer welfare standard that more centrally has placed let's call retail metrics of price, output, innovation, uh, and quality, and their impacts of structure and structural changes uh, and firm conduct on those metrics as determinative of whether a particular case warrants, uh, warrants antitrust enforcement or not. So that has happened over time as a centripetal force. I think the other thing that has happened as a centripetal force is that, let's call it the outer bounds of 
uh, of antitrust, the four corners of what properly sits within the domain of antitrust and what properly sits outside the domain of antitrust have more congealed. Uh, what has happened over time in the last mm, three to five years, I would say, is that there have been some centrifugal forces that have arisen that are pulling at the fabric of that congealing effect. Uh, there are a number of voices that have identified a number of economic ailments in our society, uh, uh, income inequality, low wage growth, um, low startup rates, uh, productivity slowdown that have, for whatever reason, been placed at the doorstep of antitrust as being either partly or solely responsible for those, for those problems. So I think where we are, to get just back to your question, Mark, of where we are, I think we're at a moment of self-reflection, a moment of introspection. There are a number of studies that are going on, and there are scholars and practitioners around the country that are really seriously thinking about where we are and what we ought to do going forward. Okay. Other comments on that? So, John, um, Howard's comments really are a nice segue into a question that I had for you. Uh, in thinking about some of the underlying uh, developments in the economy that may be leading to some of the calls for increased antitrust enforcement, um, one concern that we hear is that there is de decreasing competition in our economy as a whole or in particular sectors. Um, as an empirical matter, and that that may be resulting from lax antitrust enforcement. I know you've done some work and some research on that, and I'd like you to talk about it if you could. Yes, uh, happy to. Um, so the narrative that has unfolded over the last three or five years, and this is a bit of a simplification, but it pretty well captures it, I believe, is that there are three things that have happened. Number one, uh, Howard alluded to this, that there's a perception of increased economic concentration in this country. Uh, secondly, that there's been lax enforcement that has happened unfolded over the last 20 years or so. And that together, number one and number two, that is economic concentration, have created a monopoly problem and we haven't been enforcing the antitrust laws vigorously, have led to this raft of economic problems high income inequality, low wage growth, uh, low productivity growth rates, and so on. Uh, so what, what I wanted to do with, together with my colleague Jeff Macker, who introduced the panel, was to, to look at these, these areas. Now, each one of those areas deserves careful, dispassionate analysis. And today, let me only talk about one of those, and that is the issue of have antitrust regulators gone asleep at the switch. Uh, and what we did to address this is to look at the data that actually exists regarding merger enforcement. And so what we did is we went back to the, the filings of the antitrust uh, uh, agencies to the Federal Trade Commission and Department of Justice back to 1979 and asked the question, of the mergers that have been reported to the antitrust agencies, what share of them, what share of them have been ultimately challenged? And so together this creates a little bit of a, a simple but I think appealing metric of, or an insight and window into how vigorous have antitrust agencies been in enforcing the antitrust laws if you see that number as the narrative goes, falling. That is to say that, that antitrust agencies are less inclined to challenge mergers over time, then it really feeds into that narrative and corroborates that narrative. Now, what we did is to look at, uh, at challenges very broadly considered, not just challenges that are court challenges made by the Department of Justice in a district court, but rather looked at uh, a broad array of challenges that include administrative complaints, uh, preliminary injunctions, consent decrees, uh, and even declarations of an intent to file uh, 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 if there, the parties don't uh, abandon merger or uh, abide by the conditions uh, imposed by the FTC or the Department of Justice. So what happens when you look at that ratio? Well, how far down has it gone? 
Well, perhaps a bit surprisingly, uh, the ratio has not gone down. It has gone up, and it has gone up over time, over the last 30 years, not only in a, uh, in a sort of trend line, but in an economically and statistically significant fashion. It turns out that you can reject the null hypothesis that, that the upward trend is just randomly occurring. It, it is going up, and it's going up at an economically significant level. If you control for the number of merger challenges, what's actually happened is the rate of challenge, the propensity to challenge a merger, has doubled over the last 30 years. And that's really quite, I think, important. Um, now, the good news takeaway of that is that, that we can be a little more confident that there's a willingness and a propensity of the antitrust enforcement agencies to challenge mergers. And that's, a, that's perhaps a good thing. It does provoke, it of course does provoke the question of why. Why might we have observed that trend? And in the paper that I think is on the, paper, on the desk outside, we identify two factors. One, I would say, is technical, and the other is obvious and important. Uh, the technical one is that in the year 2000, Congress passed a set of amendments to the uh, Hart-Scott-Rodino Act that raised the thresholds uh, for filing a merger. And that meant that larger mergers were filed with the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission, but smaller mergers uh, have been less reported now, or are not reported now. And that has had the consequence of focusing the DOJ and the FTC on areas on the larger mergers that are likely to be more problematic. The second reason, which is the one that I think is more obvious and also important, is that we looked at budgets. What happens to enforcement challenges when you raise the budget uh, appropriations to the DOJ and the FTC? It turns out, unsurprisingly to people in this room, but important, it goes up. People challenge more mergers when they have a little bit more resources at their, at their disposal. In fact, what we find is that if you were to increase the uh, appropriation rates by 10% relative to 2017 levels, you'd get an 8% increase in merger challenges. Now, that all is nice, but then today we're here to talk about tech, I think, and, and there in the tech space, you might say, well, okay, yes, enforcement has gotten more vigorous, but maybe tech's gotten a pass. And this falls outside the scope of our paper, but what we did is to look at, at mergers in the tech space. Have there been mergers in the tech space? And the answer is yes, of course there have been. It turns out over the last 18 years, in the industry most associated with big tech, it's called NAICS code 518, that includes Google, Amazon, and uh, Facebook, there have been 521 mergers. That's a lot of mergers. Uh, and that's sort of scary. And it's scary until you ask the question, well, how many mergers have there been in the economy? And the answer to that is 27,000. So 1.9% of all mergers over the last 18 years have been in big tech. 98.1% of the mergers have been in the non-big tech area. So it perhaps is not so surprising that there's been a little less attention in the big tech space than we might otherwise like to see. Then you can say, well, gosh, but maybe big tech mergers are more problematic than, than other mergers. Here we could look at, let's call it intra-industry mergers. Maybe, maybe big tech has been more inclined to have mergers within the same industry that eliminate a competitor. Uh, but it turns out that if you look economy-wide, economy-wide, about 30% of all mergers within an industry are within the, within the industry and 70% outside. So about 30% of all mergers are intra-industry, those that at least might at first blush create some concern. In the big tech area, it's only 11.5%, only 11.5%. So on average, big tech mergers have been a little less likely to be the sort that would draw our concern. Finally, when intra-industry mergers have gone to the FTC and the Department of Justice, the question arises, 
Have they gotten a good serious look? Have they gotten a good serious look? One measure of that is, and it's a bit of a term of art, have the mergers been cleared to either the DOJ or the FTC, that is to say, assigned to the DOJ and FTC staff for a serious look. And, and there, what I will tell you is in the last 10 years, in the last 10 years, economy-wide, economy-wide, what we've got is about 50% uh, of, of uh, non-big tech mergers received a close look, 90% of big tech mergers received a close look. Now, all of that mean, does not mean that we shouldn't continue to focus on big tech, that we shouldn't uh, look at conduct, we shouldn't look at mergers that might harm competition, uh, and certainly their conduct in the monopolization space, but it does mean that the narrative has not quite been as accurate as, as we'd like. Anyone have comments or questions on that? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to jump in. Thank you. Sure. That was uh, fascinating. And of course, as uh, someone who served at both the antitrust division and the FTC in the last um, years or so, um, I am gratified to hear that antitrust enforcement has been relatively vigorous. It was definitely my perception oh, while I was at the agencies. And I, and I think there is something to that. I think it's important, though, to, to remember that um, some of the other literature that Howard was pointing to is also out there. So there is a bit of a challenge in reconciling some of the reports that came out of, for example, the Council of Economic Advisors at the end of the Obama administration that looked very much at macro level concentration, some of the literature that's looking at dynamism slowing in a troubling way in the US economy, um, and, and some of the literature that is actually growing. When, when we first started looking at this issue in 2014, there was about this much, well, maybe this much economic economic literature, well, and then the pick, this pick, um, on economic inequality and the connection to concentration in a macro level in, in the economy. And now there's like this much literature on it. So it's really interesting. And, and I think that we need to think more broadly, uh, systemically, about some of the information that is flowing from that literature. But at the same time, it's not surprising to me that antitrust enforcement and whether um, the antitrust laws are being properly applied and, and whether we are thinking about this conceptually the right way is very much a part of that conversation. I don't think we can antitrust our way out of an economic concentration problem at the macro level, because especially since antitrust tools are very good at micro level, market level economics, but not very good at macro level problems, not applied in that way. Um, but, but I do think that they are probably a part of the solution. And one of the things that definitely happens in the debate that we're having right now is, I think, an, uh, um, an overzealous focus on antitrust law as a solution, and we kind of lose, uh, we focus on the tree and we lose the forest, and we need to think more broadly if we're worried about some of these macro. Good. Paul? One, one quick comment. Yep. Yeah, I probably don't need the microphone. So just, um, just so we're clear, though, and I, I agree with especially that last comment that you made about whether antitrust is the appropriate uh, mechanism for actually achieving some of the goals that, that we're describing here is related. But the literature that's out there and the, the empirical work that's been done on, on general macro level concentration in community is, is, is not settled, right? I think we all agree. This is, there's a, there's a lot of literature, but you can kind of divide it up into two camps and then put a bunch of it in the middle. There isn't, there isn't a consensus that, in fact, there is a concentration problem uh, in, in the United States or elsewhere. One additional comment, a related comment, is about, uh, is about Europe, right? Um, which we haven't, we haven't discussed, but the consensus that we've been describing for the most part, and I, I, my law firm here, most important law firm in the world is, uh, is, is, based, is based in London, has its center of gravity in, in Europe, and I'm, I'm just head of their Washington operation. But uh, in Europe, the consensus that we've described is not exactly the same as, as what we have here in the U.S., because they do, at the margin, place much more emphasis on competitor complaints, on competitor ish, uh, uh, concerns about, uh, about any kind of conduct, including transactions. And they credit those, those concerns, and, and they wouldn't say, as we say, that the, the focus of the antitrust law is not merely not on competitors. Um, there, I think they do focus, in the first instance, on 
competitor conduct and, and competitor effects, and then draw inferences about adverse effects on, on the overall economy. And to kind of relate those two things uh, together, I mean, you could look, and this now I'm obviously revealing a lot of my biases, but I mean, you could look at Europe and, and ask the question, has the, more, has the greater focus on, on enforcement in Europe, the, the much more, uh, and I think we'd say at the margin, the much more vigorous enforcement that they have in Europe in, uh, under their competition laws uh, resulted in better outcomes on some of the metrics that, that uh, Tara was just mentioning, or on any other metrics. I mean, they, you know, obviously it's a, it's a slower growth economy. It's a, where they've got massive capital outflows. They've got uh, uh, no tech sector to, to bring it back to this, this particular uh, panel. Um, you know, what, how does the, the, we relate increased or vigorous antitrust enforcement to these broader macro outcomes? I'm not saying that, in fact, their vigorous antitrust enforcement has caused where they are right now. I'm just saying I think drawing broad conclusions like that is, is fraught. Um, <laughs> just, just one gloss on, on Paul and Terrell's excellent points there at the end. Um, when one looks at the tech sector, one of the criticisms now is that we're not seeing the dynamic growth in new entry and new startups, and that the tech ecosystem is stagnating a little bit. And people are pointing to antitrust as one of the reasons. But if you run that comparison with Europe, what's really interesting is they have had this stronger antitrust enforcement that is more focused on access for competitors than on efficiency in the competitive process. So then you need to ask yourself the question, why are there so many phenomenal French software engineers who've been founders of companies in Silicon Valley? <laughs> and the reason is this. There are two things that we have that they don't have. Um, the, the labor and employment laws um, are extremely different, and they're very sticky in Europe. You can't pay people with stock options, and it's uh, very tricky once somebody is hired to let them go. That does not fit startup culture for any of you who've been part of it. You're going to sleep on a couch. You're going to, compete, you're going to get paid in options. Maybe they hit. Maybe they won't. You know, uh, I've got a friend who pays his employees in gas because he can get extra credit cards and load up their cars with gas. <laughs> They're hoping that they get bought and something works. But the great thing is what's going to bail them out is the system of venture financing and a very open financial system that allows uh, a lot of capital creation at a low level. If you look at Japan, if you look at Europe, you don't see that because of a very uh, institutionalized uh, capital, uh, capital sector. So those are two things that have nothing to do with antitrust, but probably have a very high coefficient on the differences in the rate of tech growth and startup growth in the different jurisdictions. So we always have to remember, and I think, Terrell, you just nailed it. When we're looking at big tech and we're thinking about the problems, which may or may not be very real, you know, you can decide that based on the evidence. We need to look beyond antitrust as the solution because there are many policy tools that are going to have to be brought to bear to address some of the concerns. <clears throat> Okay, well my job is easy because the discussion is carrying us along uh, perfectly. I want to pivot now to, uh, in some ways, the central topic for today. Let's talk about the kinds of conduct that have been raised as concerns uh, towards some of the big tech platforms. You don't need to, it's fine if we don't talk about specific companies, feel free to if you want to. But just ge generically, I have kind of in my mind tried to arrange these concerns into basically three categories. Um, one relates to mergers, and I'd like Howard to begin by addressing that, picking up on our merger discussion we just finished. A second would be various types of conduct by tech platforms directed at consumers in ways that may or may not harm consumers and that may or may not implicate antitrust or other <coughs> regulatory regimes. And then the third category I'd like to talk about is concerns about behavior directed toward competitors. So let's talk, start with mergers. Howard, if you could, uh, could just address the topic of uh, focusing on acquisitions by some of the big tech platforms aimed at, in particular, nascent <coughs> or, uh, threats or potential competitors. 
Great, thanks, Mark. So with mergers, we have two concerns. Typically, we don't want uh, firms that compete with each other to officially join forces through merger and then not have to compete with, with each other if they make up too big a part of the market. We'll let firms do that if there are lots of other competitors out there to serve you. We also don't want companies buying companies that either supply a key input to production or a key distribution network, so an upstream or downstream asset that the company needs. We don't want to let them acquire that asset if that other producer, upstream or downstream, if it's going to make it harder for other firms to get access to what those now combined firms produce. So for example, we don't want somebody to buy up the sole uh, producer of some kind of important microchip if other companies need to buy that microchip, because then you might say, great, I, have, I, mean, I, I am the owner of the upstream input. I'm not going to let any of my competitors have access to it. Now I can own the market of the thing that that microchip is going into. That's called vertical foreclosure. So we're concerned about horizontal mergers amongst competitors, vertical mergers uh, with upstream and downstream firms if they can affect competition. In the tech sector, um, this has come to be a debate largely about what are called nascent competitors or small startup competitors, and it's not just digital platforms. This is a big deal in another big tech arena, big pharma, um, where we worry about large pharma producers maybe buying small startups of innovative uh, therapies uh, that could <coughs> the, 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 the leading products that these, that these other uh, companies have. And there are a lot of mergers out there right now that are getting a lot of press. AbV Allergan, who's been on uh, the front pages of the paper, um, is that you know, what they're concerned about is sort of the pipeline drugs that are being developed. Would this merger cut those off? We have similar things in the digital sector. We're certainly not going to let Amazon buy Netflix, right? Because then when you sit down at night and you're trying to decide you're going to watch something on Netflix or something on Amazon Prime, um, there, this is going to be uh, manipulated in a way to maximize the joint returns to now the joint company, um, you know, Amazon Flix or whatever it would be called. What we're really talking about is, and we're not going to let you know Google and Facebook merge. And by the way, disclosure, I do some work for one of the major platforms and some work against another one of the major platforms. So um, you can appropriately discount my remarks, but I won't tell you which one. I was going to say, by the way, we should probably say that applies to all of us. It probably us. applies so, to all yeah. okay. not, not, not to John and Mark <laughs> and Jeff, but, 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 but to the three of us. Yeah. So, um, so, so we, we have a stake in some of this. So, but I'm, but I'm going to speak generically at, uh, about the, the, the startup acquisitions. This is one of the things that's common across all of tech. Should Amazon be able to buy some startup company, should Facebook, should Google? And of course, these may, there, there are two theories on which you might want to stop them from acquiring these startup companies. One is, one of these startups might grow up to be the next Amazon, you know, be the next com big competitor. We don't want Amazon buying some company that's small now, but that down the road could, uh, could threaten it. Um, so we want to create an ecosystem in which the companies that are uh, allegedly dominant um, can be challenged by upstarts, and you don't want them to acquire those upstarts as a means of preserving their market share and their monopoly. Um, so that's one concern. Could these nascent competitors become a, uh, uh, could 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 become full-on competitors? The other concern that we have is. There are all these really smart people out there developing really cool technology in related lines of business. And if just a few companies own all the talent, all of the IP, all of the know-how, um, that's going to create a problem. Now a new startup gets up into the marketplace. They want to find the right en kinds of engineers. They want access to the right technology. I'm the parent of a 21-year-old who's struggling to do just this, and he's you know, running into blocks everywhere. This is IP protected. This guy won't talk to us because his company just got bought by so-and-so. You know, it can be tough for, for, for young entrepreneurs. Are these startup acquisitions making it harder for other startups to get the talent, the know-how, the technology they need uh, to grow up and, and, and become uh, beneficial for all of us in the way that a lot of these large platforms have become ben very beneficial to all of us, even if some people now are concerned about some of the effects they're having. 
So there is this new focus on uh, startup acquisitions. And I want to make uh, a couple of comments about this. First of all, this is very challenging, right? How do you know whether some little startup of eight people and no revenues, but some interesting technology could possibly grow into being a competitive threat or be like most other such startups that tried to go it alone and either grow into something modest or fail. This is a very hard thing to predict up front. So the, the startup acquisition idea is sort of an interesting one that has, I think, some good um, uh, intellectual and theoretical grounding, but it's very, very hard to put in place in practice. There's another thing that we need to keep in mind. There's a reason people do startups now. They do startups because there's an exit path to be acquired by all of these big companies. And a lot of people will take the risk. That means financers, that means you know, young people you know, skipping school or coming out of school and sleeping on couches because they've got a vision that's something they want to produce. What's that? <laughs> With their gas card or you know, whatever it is exactly, you know, just trying to make it work because they know there's an exit path out there. What happens if you make it harder for the companies that provide that exit path the big tech companies, the medium tech companies, then do you actually limit startup? So the, the, the young kid who's creating a new controller for virtual reality or AR doesn't say, I'm going to go it alone and try to, try to develop this controller and get it into the marketplace. What he says is, I'm just going to go to work for Oculus. And you get less diverse innovation and you get less startup uh, occurring. So there's a trade-off that we should all keep in mind when we hear these debates about nascent competitors. The exit path is very important. It incentivizes people to take risk in financing innovation and being innovators themselves. But it can also bias the direction of those innovations. So when you hear terms like killer acquisition or don't squelch the nascent competitors, listen to it, think about it. There's something there but it's double-edged and it's very hard to implement. Just one quick comment, yeah. just a, about the level of uncertainty that's associated with this, and I, I'm not suggesting that, that Howard's saying anything different or that Carol would disagree with this. But, you know, there, there's a, a huge amount of uncertainty in everything that we're talking about when it comes to nascent competitors in tech. And just to make a quick distinction with pharma, I do a ton of deals in the pharma space. In, in pharma, when you're talking about potential competition, there's a large number of cases. That in, but in pharma, there's a clear regulatory path for any product that's being developed. Everybody knows in, at the FDA, at the FTC, when they review these things, they know exactly where that product, that, that molecule is going to be, which competitive set it will sit in, where, which indication it's addressing, what the method of action is, and Very everything else. So they know exactly where it's going. In tech, I mean, you know, when, uh, we, by the way, the, the exact same team that, uh, that reviews all those pharma deals are, are the, the folks who reviewed the Instagram deal. And you ask them, uh, you know, who are hardworking people who are trying to find cases, they want to go find these cases. You ask them about their view of Instagram at the time that they did it, and with the nine employees, and you know all the metrics that everybody talks about on, on Instagram. There's a huge amount of uncertainty, even for people who are pushing the burden of proof onto uh, the, uh, the acquiring firms to, say, to tell them why the, com the, the deal is not a competitive problem. They still couldn't find you know, a, a enough certainty, enough confidence about where that product was going, where that platform was going to know that, that it, it's something that should be challenged. So it's easy to look at this you know, seven years later. It was extraordinarily difficult seven years ago. Uh, just to echo some of the things to amplify what has been said, it, this area of nascent competition is, is very, very difficult. Uh, it's very difficult to identify which firms are going to grow into prospective competitors and which firms are going to grow into prospective complementers. Uh, there is a bit of a narrative that, again, the antitrust enforcement agencies have either been unwilling or unable or have not used uh, an analysis or a lens of looking at and thinking about uh, nascent competitors when, when <coughs> analyzing mergers. And of course, I just want to point out that isn't quite right. 
Uh, there's, uh, and I hesitate to cite case law to a bunch of lawyers here, but there's uh, rich literature in the, in the legal arena dating back to the 1960s with Procter & Gamble and its purchase of, of Clorox on potential competition and, and nascent competition going up to more recent tech acquisitions like Google DoubleClick that in which the, the press release specifically talks about and tries to evaluate the role of nascent competition. Mm -hmm. It's a tough area, but I think it's not quite accurate to say that the antitrust authorities haven't been willing to take this on as best they are able. Yes, thank you for saying that. <laughs> uh, so, so I would just underscore um, the, the thing I said about the Clayton Act being incipient, it, it means that you're engaged in an inherently predictive activity when you're on the enforcement side. So you are trying to understand what, how is the marketplace going to evolve and what is the impact of this particular transaction on it. When you're thinking about potential competition, nascent competition, it's all the more complicated because you're trying to guess out of some time horizon. By the way, it's not really defined. Could be two years, could be five years, but you're basically taking things as they currently exist, trying to guess what will happen. And your best evidence is really um, the economic incentives, of course, what, what is likely to happen given the incentives in the marketplace. But also, what do the documents say the businesses are doing? And when you're in uh, pharmaceutical markets and you have these investments and pipelines and regulatory um, proceedings, you kind of can predict with a little more accuracy maybe what might happen. When you're in a tech market, it's much harder to make an accurate prediction. In fact, um, agencies have challenged these mergers and sometimes lost. So um, while I was at the FTC, we challenged Steris Energy for and look it up, I won't get into it right now, uh, took it to a court fact finder or judge there, took a careful look at all the facts and was like, nope, you're not right. It's not more likely that, that this company is going to enter and compete. It was about two years later, a year and a half later, but, but we lost that case. So I mean, I think it underscores that, that these cases can be very, very challenging and depend heavily on the facts involved. Uh, only other thing I'd like to say is we, we can flay a little bit um, potential competition, nascent competition, and killer acquisition. These are actually slightly different things, I think, and especially in the killer acquisition idea, um, I think sometimes uh, people, I, I, I'm not even really sure what it means, but suffice it to say, um, if there's no dead bodies, <laughs> then I'm not sure it's a killer, so it's probably nascent or potential competition, and a lot of times you don't actually see, uh, you know, a killer acquisition might be like, we are buying you and we are definitely going to take you out of the market so we can definitely raise our prices. We see that, sorry, a little more in the pharmacy side than we, than we have necessarily in the tech side. I, I just note that this is an area where the agencies, the FTC in particular, when they announced the formation of their tech task force, said, I think specifically, that one thing they'll be looking at is prior consummated acquisitions, which they do have the authority to do. Whether the deal was reviewed under the HSR Act or not, the, uh, the agencies still have the legal power to go back and investigate a uh, prior deal, even if it was cleared, uh, and they have done so, in, particularly in the healthcare sector. So I think an interesting question that we'll, perhaps we'll have answered over the next few months is what the agencies will do with evidence after the fact of an acquisition, um, and which direction do certain kinds of facts cut? If the acquired entity went nowhere in the hands of the big tech platform, does that mean they weren't such a serious threat after all and their technology was no good, or that the big tech platform squelched it after they bought it, killed it? Uh, on the other hand, if the acquired uh, company, uh, acquired product did extremely well in the hands of the big tech platform. Does that mean that they were an important uh, potential competitor and they should have been allowed to continue to compete independently? Or does it mean that they succeeded in part because they were acquired by a well-resourced company that could make the best use of their technology? So this will be the challenge, I think, for the FTC and the Justice Department to the extent that they are, I think, right now embarking on looking at some of these deals uh, that have been alluded to, and we'll see where they head. Okay, let me turn to the second category of activities by tech platforms that have led to some to call for uh, increased antitrust enforcement or new antitrust rules or both. And here I'm sort of grouping together conduct um, that I'm characterizing as aimed primarily at consumers, where the impact of the conduct by the tech firm is felt primarily or initially on consumers themselves, whether concerns about how data are aggregated 
segregated or handled, concerns about privacy, uh, concerns about con content moderation or the lack thereof. Um, so it, taking this as a sort of category, and it's obviously very broad, um, Terrell, perhaps you could address this. What, what is the nature of these concerns as you see them? Yeah, all right. To what extent does antitrust offer a, a solution? I'm going to talk really fast because I know we're tight on time, and there's a lot here. And I just want to take issue with the question just a little bit to say um, I, I'm, I'm going to describe a whole bunch of conduct and a whole bunch of stuff that everybody cares a lot about right now, especially in tech policy land. Um, but I, I don't want to, I don't want you to take away the idea that I'm attributing it to as conduct by platforms themselves, right? I think this is just like technology policy stuff people care about and, and how and, and if it's directly connected. To, to conduct by individual companies. Like, uh, I'm going to let that be over here for a minute. All right, so I just have been making a list while I've been sitting here thinking about this question. Content moderation comes to mind, bias, discrimination, privacy, dark patterns, manipulation of any kind, political speech, advertising, disinformation, national security, free expression, First Amendment, autonomous predictive systems. Um, I could probably keep going. Big data, access to data, data portability, interoperability. Um, so these are all uh, areas that are really important technology policy areas. Um, some of these are externalities, I think, that are um, really part of the whole transformation of our economy into a digital economy. I think they're all worthy subject matters for policymakers and stakeholders. What's interesting about this moment, as someone who's worked on the consumer protection side, on the privacy issues in some of those areas, is we actually have industry calling out for action. We have a lot of bipartisan interest in action, so it's a very unprecedented moment. I think uh, I get the, the idea that we, if we can just antitrust a little bit more in some of these markets, we'll get more competition and woo, it'll be magic, right? And competition is awesome. I love competition. I work in antitrust law. I think it's fascinating. I think it's a very powerful force in markets. Um, but uh, fundamentally, it's about unleashing companies to pursue the incentives where they take them in the marketplace. And um, it's not necessarily awesome for addressing externalities, especially if we collectively decide as a society we want to uh, assess the cost benefit of addressing some of them and go ahead and regulate and address them. So that's why we have regulatory tools. I think they can be much more effective, especially since if you unleash competition in certain markets, you may not actually get better outcomes on any of these values. So, so that's really the, the balance. Um, people also talk about natural monopolies. The, that is such a thing. And for a long time, we've recognized <coughs> in markets that tend towards concentration because of other features of them, that, that actually a regulatory solution is a better solution there. Now, that can take a variety of forms. In the U.S., we don't tend to like um, kind of hardcore price regulation. We see that as, I think, a very blunt instrument. But um, there are a number of different tools in the regulatory toolkit that can be brought to bear, antitrust certainly being one of them, but it's not actually very good if you're trying to solve for a lot of these other problems, which is why I think um, we have a, a debate that rightly includes a broader set of issues. Um, I would just, I guess, add that um, you know, in, in this environment, I, I'm certainly not trying to suggest that competition couldn't yield better outcomes. I think it, it can in many markets. It's just a little bit unclear, especially if um, the consumer demand side of the market isn't working very well, that you will drive towards those outcomes. So that's the thing I'm very, very careful of. And um, and, and to, to sort of query, you know, OK, if, if you introduce more competition here, um, what is likely to outcome for people? Um, will we actually, maybe we will see prices go down, but um, will we see less behavioral advertising in online digital advertising markets? I'm going to go with no on that, <laughs> just uh, spitballing here. But I think, I think um, you, that's why you can't really overly rely on competition. Anyone like to add to that? Well, if I heard you right, Terrell, I think I heard antitrust used as a verb for the first time, and I love it. You know, if you just antitrust a little bit more in these markets. Um, OK, um, so let's turn to the third arbitrary Whitener category of uh, tech firm conduct. And Paul, you're free to disagree with the characterization. Um, and here, thinking about activities where the primary or immediate um, target 
is a competitor, a rival. And here I'm thinking of categories including appropriating or copying others' product offerings, um, promoting the platform's own products or services over those of others, um, or in some other way disfavoring uh, the offerings or the competitive profile of competitors who do business on or through the, the, the large platform. Um, again, taking this as a broad category, if you accept it, um, and breaking it down, Paul, what kinds of conduct would we imagine within this might raise antitrust concerns, if any, under current policy? Um, if antitrust doesn't apply to some of them, should it? So, yeah. I'll, I'll speak about the microphone again. I, so, I, I think I, I don't need it. Um, but we do. <laughs> oh, okay. So, uh, uh, this is a huge category of conduct, and it's probably the category of conduct that, other than, than mergers that, that is the, the focus of, of uh, what the Hill is, is, uh, is interested in, certainly what the antitrust agencies are interested in. I uh, just want to mention two things. that it, it, it is the category of conduct that we find most interesting, which is why uh, neither Howard nor I commented on, on Terrell's <laughs> comments, because we agreed with them completely. Um, second preliminary con comment that doesn't have anything to do with, with my, uh, my subject matter, but um, so you, use, you did use antitrust as a verb, which I, I like as well, but there was also a, a, a statement, it was been used as an adjective recently, right, by, uh, by the president when he said that uh, Amazon was a very antitrust situation. Um, so I think, and it, and it is, by the way, you know, when we talk about what our biases are and what our conflicts are and, and who we represent, just remember Amazon is evil. Um, so, anyway, <laughs> they're not the one I represent. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Seriously, I'll, I'll withdraw that. I'll take it back. Um, I got some cool cheap headphones. <laughs> So, so with respect to the conduct that, that Mark was referring to, this category of conduct, the, the primary consideration here is the, uh, whether you're, you're actually talking about whether the effect of the conduct is merely harm to a competitor versus harm to competition. That's going to be my mantra throughout this. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a great difficulty in the antitrust laws or, or under antitrust law that's been recognized for decades and decades distinguishing uh, when harm to a competitor actually constitutes harm to competition, harm to consumer welfare, as we've defined it in this, this kind of consensus that we're describing. Um, again, if you're in Europe, the, there's a, a much easier inference that seems to be drawn between harm to a competitor and harm to competition. Here in the United States, where the consensus is much more focused on consumer welfare, uh, we've, we've got a great concern about uh, making sure that we're not disincentivizing firms from, from doing what they can to grow, to, to make great products uh, and, and, uh, and sell them at the lowest prices. Uh, and we, we also want to, on the, the flip side of that, make sure that we're not disincentivizing uh, those firms from, uh, from engaging in those efforts to the benefits of, of consumers. So what we've done, and again, I'm simplifying a huge amount of jurisprudence over decades, but what we've done here in the United States and what the courts have done is, is to, to place a pretty significant burden of proof onto plaintiffs in these cases of alleged dominant firm or exclusionary or predatory behavior. That's been criticized very heavily by a lot of the, uh, many of the commentators uh, uh, recently. Those of us, or those who, who are within the general kind of consumer welfare consensus, uh, as well as, as, uh, as those who suggest that we should be looking at other objectives in, in antitrust. But I'm gonna try to, to confine this, this discussion to the, uh, the consensus around the consumer welfare standard. But we do place a pretty heavy burden on, on plaintiffs in these cases because we wanna make sure that the, or the and, the, and the, uh, the, the antitrust agencies have been trying to make sure that we don't disincentivize firms uh, from producing great products and doing what Howard just described as, as maybe the one good thing that Amazon does. So again, I'm, I'm joking. Um, I, I did. I represented the publishers in their disputes with uh, with Amazon uh, when uh, Amazon was engaged in sort of obvious predatory behavior. Uh, yeah, right, yeah, and, and so here's the debate, right? Um, 
So, but uh, actually, no, my, my general biases are, are to suggest that what Amazon was doing was appropriate. Uh, my, um, my private uh, firm and client-oriented biases are to say that Amazon is evil. Uh, and by the way, that's, that kind of exemplifies the, the nature of the debate here. I think there's, you know, we have a great concern, right, about in, in antitrust law and in regulatory policy generally about allowing uh, firms to engage in rent-seeking behavior, to, to um, engage in, in activity that is on their own behalf uh, and to manipulate the regulatory process or the law enforcement process in a way that, that benefits competitors themselves and, and uh, doesn't actually advance the, the broader objectives of public policy in protecting consumer welfare and protecting consumers. And this is where we get into these debates about, uh, for example, predatory behavior, predatory pricing. A classic example of, uh, in, and that was the, the case there, I mean, a classic example of this, you know, the dispute that exists between competitors and, and competition in, in predatory conduct as well as much exclusionary conduct. In the first instance, the benefit of that conduct by a single firm is to benefit consumers. Lower prices, predation, benefits consumers. Now this is, the, high, this, the tech platform issues don't really relate necessarily directly to predatory pricing, but this, this I think illustrates the, uh, the issue very clearly. Predatory pricing, good for consumers as a start. Right, and then the question is, does the predatory pricing drive out competition uh, competitors, other competitors, in a manner that in the long run will result in a monopoly, and then as a result of the monopoly, higher prices for, for consumers? Almost the same thing could be said about any type of exclusionary behavior, any type of, of predatory behavior, then in the first instance, it may have beneficial effects. The, the, uh, there's some of these killer acquisitions, whatever that is, uh, maybe are a little bit different, but, but in terms of, uh, of, of some of the conduct that we've, we've talked about, promoting your own products on your platform to the, uh, uh, in, uh, and favoring your own products on your own platform for a digital platform, those things might actually, in the first instance, benefit consumers as they're, even if, even if in, in some way they're appropriating the intellectual property, appropriating the technology, the ideas of, uh, of their competitors, of even their nascent competitors in, on the platform. Developing those things, exploiting, disseminating that information is actually beneficial to consumers in the first instance. And then the concern under the antitrust laws is whether in the long run it might actually drive those competitors out of business and also, as Howard was suggesting, dis disincentivize other companies from forming to then compete uh, on, those, on those platforms or with the platforms in competition. And that's a very difficult balancing in over the, the decades, over the last few decades, the, uh, clearly the Supreme Court and, uh, and other courts and, and I think even the agencies, even in the agencies that, uh, that, that these two served in, uh, in the last administration, the bias has been towards uh, placing the burden of proof on complainants, on competitors to ensure that we are not undermining the competitive process, not undermining consumer welfare when making this very difficult distinction between uh, exclusionary behavior that in some way uh, can, can uh, harm competition, certainly harms competitors, and the exclusionary behavior that in the long run actually is harmful to competition and harmful to, to consumers. So that's in the interest of time. I'll leave it at that very broad description, but that is, that's the nature of the debate. Other panelists? Yes, so, so I have a wrap question, but before I turn to that, let me open it to the floor for questions about anything we've discussed so far, anything you'd like us to discuss. And before we end, I want to throw another question out to the panel about some of the policy proposals that have been made uh, that would depart from current antitrust principles. But please, the floor is uh, open to any of you. And I have a microphone here if you have a question. Yes. I'm with the center, uh, the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy. I think one of the issues that has been raised about why it may be difficult to figure out whether or not there is consumer welfare is that an awful lot of platforms are free. So how do you, if you don't have pricing as a measure, 
how do you figure out whether or not you're helping or hurting consumer or what you're doing to pricing? It's one question related to it is that the reason it's free is that most of it is paid for by advertising. And it's the fact that these folks, the platforms that are looking for advertising is what causes them to look for all of that data, which has become another whole topic in terms of big tech, the whole privacy issue. So whoever wants to take those on, I'd be grateful. Yeah, I mean, those those are, and Aria, thanks. Those, those are both big questions, but let me, let me just take a stab at, at both sides of the question. So, on one hand, as an economist, I can sit here and say free is just means that the price is zero. And there's no reason to think that that's a competitive price. Perhaps the price should be negative. Perhaps the platform should be paying us for the data that we give them so that they can then turn around and sell more tailored advertising. Um, getting, paying people for data is kind of tricky. Um, and clunky, and most people would probably find the whole process cumbersome, so zero is just sort of a nice approximation of, of, of a pragmatic way uh, to approximate the price. But here's, there, there are other parameters that we care a lot about, and we care about these parameters not just in tech markets. Quality, choice, uh, the consumer experience, uh, do you get good customer service? Do you get any customer service? Do our policies clearly spelled out? Is the product easy to use and easy to customize? These are all things quite apart from price that I think consumers respond to very readily. And particularly in the tech platforms, there are two things that the consumers are very attentive to. You may be able to do all kinds of stuff on Facebook for free. You don't have to pay uh, an entry fee to the massive Amazon mall. You can search Google for free. What monetizes all of that is uh, either profits from what you're buying or advertising. But if you bombard people with too many irrelevant ads, they're not going to be very interested in using your platform or sticking around your platform if the ads are you know, d distracting or unpleasant. So there's a quality dimension there. If the searches are terrible, and if people start to get the idea that they're biased or that they're useless, um, you know, like some restaurant review sites that shall remain nameless, I mean, they're completely, you know, rigged and, you know, completely useless sites. If uh, certain uh, products like on search and things like that uh, become de denigrated to the point that people don't want them, then uh, the zero price doesn't really mean much. So there are these other dimensions by which we can measure the performance of these platforms. And I think that the platforms are judged on those by consumers. Just a word about data. There are lots, we could talk all day about data. There's so many issues. There's data privacy, as Terrell made clear. There's data security. Um, but there's also the question of, do these platforms have too much data? And that's where the antitrust debate has come to be focused. Is it possible for somebody else to get into some of these markets when they don't have accessible to them these massive databases on which to train algorithms and to do machine learning and to learn so much about consumers so that they too can sell good and tailored advertising? It's a very complicated story. Catherine Tucker from MIT, very fine economist, has done really good studies where she's shown that actually data is not a roadblock to startups and new folks coming in. There are many, many sources of data. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, some folks have countered that with arguments that say uh, access to the data is critical. So I, I want to put aside, you know, th th those bigger questions because I think they would take up the rest of our time, but they are very important. These big tech platforms are double-sided markets. You're matching advertisers with users. The advertisers pay. The users get their service for free. On the other hand, the advertisers have to feel like they're getting their money's worth, that they're not just appearing on a page, but they're getting clicks. And users have to feel like they're not getting overly bombarded by advertising, the services they're getting are good, and uh, the advertising that they are getting is at least somewhat relevant to them. So I think that th there are pretty positive incentives across this platform, and you don't need a price to create important, you know, the powerful incentives to serve those users. Other questions? 
Thank you so much. Um, I want to go back to one of the goals that you mentioned at the beginning, um, minimizing large profits or as a, as a goal in itself of antitrust. I was wondering if you could clarify that a little bit, because that seems to be focused on the benefit rather than harm to the consumers or the competitors. Thank you. Hey, I'll just say a quick word, and I'm sure my colleagues have a lot to say about that. So let's be clear. Antitrust is not opposed to profits, but high profits are a sign that there is not competition You know, in the basic microeconomic framework. And so what we want in so far as possible is to prevent acts that maintain those high profits. So if, let's say that you start to face a lot of competitive entry into your market. You're a pioneer, but you're facing a lot of entry. And suddenly your profits are diminishing because consumers have choices. And how do the different entrants attract consumers through quality and price? Um, so then you say, OK, I don't like this. This isn't fun. I want my profits back. I'm going to buy that rival. Merger policy is designed to prevent you from taking that action through merger to preserve those profits. Paul talked about uh, activities you might take to block arrival from the market, you know, certain conduct you might engage in, tying, predatory pricing, things like that. Uh, again, it's fine to be a monopolist. If you've justly earned it, you can have, charge as high a price as you want. What antitrust wants to do is prevent any actions that artificially or unwarrantedly perpetuate that. High profits are what attract people into business, so they're a good thing. When you no longer are justly deserving them because there's a competitor or you're not maintaining the quality, then you shouldn't be allowed to take actions that, uh, that, that block competition and artificially maintain them. I mean, I would, I would just add, I think, um, the point you made about if you see them sort of sustained over a long period of time, then that may be an indication that there isn't enough competition occurring, because what, where is the entry that should be attracted to that profit level, right? That, I think that's the that's right. Yeah, so just real quickly on uh, just a quick comment on that, because I think what was key is the, the, those last couple of points about maintaining the high profitability based on conduct that, that can be identified as anti-competitive, because I think everybody agrees that, that um, innovation and in particular innovation that's, that's protected by intellectual property, but innovation tends to be associated with high profits. And innovation also is clearly empirically associated with the, the greatest consumer welfare benefits uh, that, that are achieved through competitive conduct or corporate conduct. So uh, I think we, we need to just make sure that we're, we're talking about it. Antitrust also, by the way, for, for the reasons that both of the other panelists have said, antitrust is also very much focused on promoting innovation and protecting innovation from competitive, uh, harmful competitive activity. By promoting innovation, again, in the short run, as Tara was just mentioning, in the sh shortish run, maybe the medium term, whatever, we're, however we're going to define that, actually results in, in high profits. And in fact, antitrust has promoted that high profitability by promoting innovation in the short run. I just want to go back to uh, the issue of there being an incredibly high burden of proof that is placed when, well, to continue the verb usage of antitrust in antitrusting. What would be, I guess, an example that you guys use to illustrate that sort of high burden of proof when antitrust action would be brought forward? Let's start. Go ahead. I mean, the, the, so it's a great question, and there are a lot of examples. And I think it appears less in the merger arena. Um, which is generally the government after an administrative process bringing the case, and more, more, but not exclusively in the private arena. So uh, let me give you an example. Suppose that um, you have a, uh, a, a rival that is pricing so low in the marketplace that you know, and not as a promotion, like for a year, for two years, they have other lines of business. And you know this food truck also happens to own you know a power plant, and he's selling burritos for a buck and a half out on the street. And you're like, you can't power your truck for a buck and a half. This guy is predatorily pricing to squeeze me out of the market. And he's waiting until my burrito truck is out of there so he can jack his prices back up. In the first instance, what we say in antitrust law is, hey, that's great. People are getting dollar fifty burritos for now, as Paul said. So, as a, so suppose you're the rival food truck trying to sell a six buck burrito and you want to file this suit. Based on Supreme Court doctrine that has you know, been in place since 1992, 
It's not enough for you just to show that that burrito truck is out there selling burritos at far below any reasonable measure of cost, even below marginal cost. It doesn't even cover the gas on the truck. That's not enough. You also have, because that would be economically irrational behavior that they must be doing for some reason, right? Not, people don't run food trucks as charities. You then, the plaintiff, you as the plaintiff have to prove recoupment that you have to recoup the, uh, that, that the defendant will sometime, at some point be able to recoup the profits it's now losing by giving away those burritos. That's an extremely hard thing for a plaintiff to do. You don't have access to the financial data and to all the ways that that rival food truck might be covering its costs. You don't know what its future business plans are. Let me give you another case that's very recent. Uh, Ohio against American Express, Supreme Court case. The issue there was about uh, the, the, a rule that said that merchants could not steer consumers to one credit card or another. Now, Amex has a very high fee on merchants. So if somebody comes in and pulls out their Amex card, what the merchant wants is that person to put that Amex card back in their wallet and pull out their Visa card where the fee's about half. You are, you are kicked off the Amex network if you're found to have steered consumers away from the Amex card. And this was viewed as an anti-competitive, harmful practice because it, it basically was forcing merchants to take a high-cost product and was preventing them from bringing in the competition from these lower-cost cards. Amex came in and they said, well, we're part of a two-sided market. We have merchants who take our cards. We have consumers who use our cards to buy products. Those higher fees we get from the merchants, we use those to give really great benefits to our cardholders through points and loyalty programs and all of that. So the merchants might claim this hurts them, but it's good for the consumers. Okay, so now the question that came up to the Supreme Court was, whose burden of proof is it to show that the harm to the merchants is greater than the benefit to the consumers. Because then if it's the case, on balance you have a harmful bit of conduct here. In normal antitrust cases, you would think, all that the plaintiff needs to do is prove that the plaintiff, the merchants, that the conduct is harmful to them. It would then be up to the defendant to have the burden of saying, but there's an offsetting efficiency. The offsetting efficiency is the benefit to the cardholders of these great points programs we have. The Supreme Court said, you know, in these kind of network markets where it's like a two-sided market, a card charges merchants to benefit consumers, and there are these cross-network effects, the more we charge the merchants, the better it is for the consumers on the points program. In those kinds of markets, the plaintiff bears both burdens, not just to show that, the har that there is harm uh, you know, to the merchants, but those merchant plaintiffs and the states who join them, um, they, uh, they also have to show that the offsetting benefit to consumers uh, is not sufficiently great to be an efficiency. That is a really, that will make it very difficult to ever sue in a network context as a plaintiff. I think we have time for, for one more. Yeah, this is um, a bit, I guess, off the, the big tech track, but I want to talk about entertainment. And one of the largest mergers and acquisition companies that I'm aware of is Live Nation Entertainment that owns venues, uh, the promotional aspects of it, uh, some music companies, uh, they're almost a monopoly. So has anyone done a case study or any kind of examination of the SEC filings of Live Nation and its control of the entertainment industry? Um. I have not specifically. I think it's a really interesting point. There was, um, a, I think, a DOJ, the the Live Nation Ticketmaster um, transaction, and there's a consent decree there, and there's been activity around it as well. I haven't followed it that carefully, um, and I don't know if the consent has expired or not. So I, you, you ask a great question, and I think it is related to the tech industry, and that combination was terrible. <laughs> Live Nation Ticketmaster, if you ask me. Um, I think that that market is a monopoly, and I think it's got some real pathologies to it. And if I, I think I heard that the DOJ might be doing a retrospective study 
of Live Nation Ticketmaster because they've been getting pushback from a lot of consumers, a lot of artists, a lot of venues because you're exactly right. They sign up the artists, they sell the tickets, they're taking over the venues. And that vertical uh, chain makes it impossible for alternatives, alternative ticket sellers, alternative venues, uh, and sometimes artists to get into a, a different chain. So you're right, that's a great example of something that where, where maybe antitrust missed a step because it was a hard market and it's one of the main markets that I, I would agree with you should be reviewed. Okay. Look, I think we're going to leave it there. Uh, our time has expired. Um, it, some of us may be able to stick around for a few minutes if we, you have questions that you didn't get a chance to ask. And I'd like to just end by thanking all of you for coming and thanking our panelists for a very interesting and informed discussion. Thank you. Thank you.